everybody's very first in-person event this semester, and I think probably the first in-person event since uh, the pandemic began. So, so welcome. Um, that's pretty exciting. I'm Grace Horton, although I'm the faculty director of the Center for Asian Studies. And um, I just wanted to also extend thanks to our executive director, Danielle, and our events planner, Liza, um, for helping make this happen. And we are really excited and honored to be able to present a rank with a talk on U.S.-China relations. Um, the person who helped make this talk possible is Stan Parsha, who is um, from our advisory council. And so he's going to um, give you a little bit more detailed introduction to Dave. And then after the talk, I'll, I'll moderate some Q&A. So, Dave and I haven't seen each other since 2020, but, but we served at the Embassy of Beijing back in the late 1990s. And, um, and even then, Dave, Dave was known as one of our best China experts in the Foreign Service. And he's since gone back to serve what, 15 years in China? More or less? Yeah, multiple tours. And so uh, he's, he was really, he came our, like our premier in China. You know? And uh, you know, he, he resigned from the Foreign Service a couple of years ago. Uh, he was the acting ambassador in Beijing, and uh, he uh, it was quite a it was quite a principled stand he took because he resigned over uh, administration taking the United States out of the uh, out of the climate agreement, and uh, it it really made quite an impact, particularly someone so senior taking a stance like that and leaving the Foreign Service, a very promising career in the Foreign Service in order to do that. So anyway, now Dave is a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Uh, he's the head of the China practice at the Cohen Group. And he teaches at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and is a Wisconsin Flaffinette School of Public Policy. Um, he, uh, he's also a, a great linguist. Uh, he's, uh, he speaks Mandarin, French, Dari, and Greek, and he won a, a, a linguist award for all the languages he can speak, and he's a native of, of Chicago. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not a tech guy. You may be spared by uh, the slideshow from my vacation. They tell me I can take this off as long as you all uh, don't charge the stage. <laughs> Uh, before you all came in, Rachel said this is the first uh, in-person event that the center has done uh, since, I think, January of 2020, so don't screw it up, Ryan. Uh, so thank you uh, for your confidence in me. I will try to do this really, really quickly, uh, even though I, I have a long slideshow of my, uh, of my uh, summer vacation. Uh, I ended up being a China person kind of by accident. I, in the mid-1980s, I got to my, first of all, I had that conversation that any parent hates to have. I sat them down and I said, Mom and Dad, I want to be a history major. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. I was a history major at the University of Illinois. I studied there for four years. And my senior year, I had a really good time. I really enjoyed what I studied. I, and I got to the, the sort of, I think it was probably March or April of 1986. I graduated in, in June. And I realized that I didn't have one single marketable skill that a company would hire me for. Uh, and, and I started thinking, what am I going to do? You know, I, in, in two months, I'm going to be on the job market. In, in 1986, it was not a very attractive job market uh, for uh, history majors in central Illinois. And I started thinking, OK, I, what I knew is, as Stan said, I, I'm from, uh, from Illinois. I'm from the Chicago area. Uh, and I knew I didn't want to go back to the south side of Chicago. And so I said, well, I'll go overseas. And, and you know, at that point, uh, if you were doing something uh, in foreign affairs, if you were interested in business or economics, it was all Japan. Or, uh, it was all Japan. Uh, the book up there, uh, I, I knew Ezra Vogel before he died. Uh, I, I made fun of him because, of course, he called it terribly wrong. But, but if, in 1986, 
that if Japan was, was uh, going from strength to strength, it was going to take the world over. But you know what? If, you, if you're looking to uh, turn yourself into a marketable commodity quickly, it was really too late for me to study Japanese very hard language, so I kind of set that aside. Uh, same thing, you know, 1986, the height of the Cold War. Uh, uh, if you're doing politics, you've got to study Russian and, and, and uh, the Soviet Union. It's too late for that as well. And so I said, well, fine, China. There are a billion Chinese. Uh, you know, that's up and coming. Maybe I will try that. Uh, went to Taiwan, kind of stumbled into a scholarship. Uh, studied there, and uh, I mean, this is for the students in the audience, uh, just to give you some hope. I, uh, my idea was I would, uh, I would study Chinese, I would learn really well, and go to the mainland and uh, uh, find a job. Deng Xiaoping had opened up China, uh, his reform and opening policy uh, I was really making the place attractive to outside investment. I finished my studies in, in May of 1989. Uh, and was going to then go over in, uh, the next month to China uh, to, uh, uh, to to find work there. Of course, June of 1989 was the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible time for the Chinese people, for the people out on the square protesting. It was also a terrible time to be thinking you were going to turn yourself into an American doing business uh, in China. Uh, but here's the good news: I had taken the Foreign Service test while I was there. Uh, uh, I, I passed it. I, I was on the hiring register and. and Waited, as Stan also did, waited for a couple of months, six months. Stan, how long did you wait? Well, Carter had a hiring freeze, so I waited three years. Yeah, so so uh, I was kind of the same way. I did, at, at a, a year and a half, I, I asked a friend, I said, why am I not getting hired? And he said, well, Dave, you passed the test, but you didn't do well enough uh, to actually uh, get an offer. That, you know, as more people take the test, uh, they're going on the hiring roster, uh, and, and you will never uh, uh, get a job in the government. And then, like Stan in his hiring freeze, the State Department ran out of money uh, to give the test. And so, kind of like the British <laughs> clearing out the jails to man the Navy, uh, they came down to me and hired me. So uh, I take from that a couple of things. Uh, I mean, for, for students, uh, obviously, uh, you don't have to be right all the time. You don't have to be right every time. I picked, you know, I was kind of guessed right once uh, and, and uh, clung to it like a drowning man. Uh, uh, you know, that, that I thought China would be going somewhere. I ended up doing, as Stan said, six assignments in China, uh, uh, ending up as the senior career diplomat, and then ultimately the head of the embassy between, uh, uh, between uh, the Obama and Trump administration. The other thing I think it's worth remembering from this was, uh, uh, you know, just because things are the, the way they are today doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be forever, right? When, when I was coming up, it was Japan, the Soviet Union, uh, you know, for the last 30 years, the assumption has been this unipolar world, the United States as the dominant power. Uh, but now, if you talk today, it's you know this inevitability of, of, of crisis and conflict between the United States and China. I'm not saying that's not possible, but but I, I urge you to keep an open mind. Uh, I no one predicted that. Um, I didn't predict personally where I would be 30 years uh, from from uh, when I showed up in Taiwan the first time, and I encourage you to keep an open mind at, as well. I indulge my history uh, a little bit. First of all, I'll say uh, I'm a Chicago and I'm from the south side of Chicago, uh, but I'm a Cubs fan. It, it is probably the best preparation I could have had uh, for U.S.-China relations, uh, because it, you know, being a Cubs fan, this was before uh, 2017, or, uh, 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 16, I guess, the World Series. Uh, because it teaches you how to suffer, uh, it teaches pain, but also <laughs> the optimism in the face of uh, empirical evidence, and how to take a long-term perspective. And I think that's important as you're thinking about uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, Deng Xiaoping has been, had, uh, from the start of my career, essentially to nearly the end, was the, the man uh, who, who sort of defined what China was and China was where China was going. A reaction against uh, the, the sort of chaos of, of Mao Zedong uh, and, and a determination to return China uh, to its rightful place of, uh, as, as the great power in Asia uh, and really one of the great powers uh, in the world. Uh, and my job was not to talk to Deng Xiaoping in my first assignment in 1990 in China as the most junior guy uh, in, in fact, uh, in our consulate in, in Shanghai. This is 
This is a scene of Shanghai back in, in the era. And you see this building here, that's the municipal building. It's where the municipal government was. And my job was, among other things, if we had visitors, con congressional delegations, or groups like that, I would be the guy who would escort them around and show them the city, uh, sit in the back, take notes while they talk to the mayor or, or other city leaders. And inevitably, uh, one of the things, and Stan will remember this from his, his time in China, one of the things you would get would, would, uh, in Shanghai, they would take you and they would give you the, the statistics on GDP and what the population is and how many square kilometers Shanghai is, and they would show you a map of the city, this big 3D map, probably three or four times the size of this table. Uh, and it would have all the buildings, they had that, you know, the scale model of the municipal building on the river. And across the river, there would be all these row after row of gleaming skyscrapers uh, uh, that uh, really stretched to beyond uh, uh, this, what the eye could see. And of course, we could just come in from the main door, and we knew it was across the river. It was a howling wasteland. There was nothing there. There was uh, agricultural land, a couple of maybe one or two story buildings, but nothing else. And of course, <laughs> Go back today, this is what you see. This is the, that's the same building. You recognize the, the municipal building. But if you look across the river, there's that row after row of gleaming buildings. And I, I mentioned that story from my time in Shanghai because China, the Chinese government, China has a lot of big plans. And the temptation a lot of times when, when I was there was to kind of roll your eyes. You know, in, in Shanghai in 1990, if you were sitting in the municipal building, the guy you were talking to had probably spent a decade in the countryside uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Because it was south of the Yangtze River, if it was the winter time, he had long woolen underwear sticking out from underneath his suit jacket and his pants. Because it was too cold, they couldn't burn, they couldn't heat the buildings in the winter time. And so everyone was freezing all the time. And, and you know, they were talking about what the plans were for China, the, the temptation was to dismiss them. That's not to say that China gets everything right, that every plan they have turns into reality. But it is, I would say, uh, it has tempered my temptation to dismiss what sound like far-fetched ideas coming from, from Chinese officials. Uh, jump ahead, how many years? A long time. So that was 1990. Uh, seen missing uh, 28, 28 years later, 19, 18 years later, uh, the, the Beijing Olympics. I count that as sort of the end of the era of Deng Xiaoping. It's a nice round number, uh, uh, 2008, 30 years of reform and opening. And the reason I, I mark it is that was really China's, as the end, this is really China's entry onto the global stage. I don't know uh, if you all remember it, if, uh, uh, if watching the uh, sort of very, very long, but really extravagant ceremony uh, that I think will never be replicated history of Olympics, just uh, eye-poppingly sophisticated. And China, uh, Chinese people looked at this and said, this is it. We have arrived uh, on the global stage. They, uh, really a proud moment for a lot of Chinese. Uh, I happen to be in Beijing three weeks later. Uh, if you were an investor in Lehman Brothers stock, uh, this is August 17th, uh, uh, 2008, when uh, the, late, the collapse of Lehman Brothers led to the global financial crisis. Uh, and almost brought the entire global uh, economy down. And the Chinese, that was kind of the other shoe uh, of, of uh, uh, that summer. First being the, the Olympics in China and standing up, and the second being sort of the gloss coming off uh, Chinese views of American built or the Western ability to manage uh, their, uh, the global economy. And from that point on, uh, Chinese leaders, Chinese economic planners, and ordinary Chinese people kind of said, we got this. Uh, you know, we are you're no longer going to put ourselves in the position of, of taking uh, American advice or Western advice. That, uh, uh, you know, that, that really marked uh, a shift in, in how China viewed the world. <laughs> I put this one up here because, first of all, The Economist is such a great magazine uh, that uh, this is an actual Economist cover. But, you know, Xi Jinping, he was not the party secretary in 2008, but I, you know, that, that I marked from 2008 until now as really a new era in, in uh, Chinese society and Chinese political life. Xi Jinping talks about national rejuvenation, uh, and 
Uh, you know, those of you who watch what's going on in China closely know that, you know, uh, uh, as hard as Deng Xiaoping worked to uh, end the era of, of one-man rule and put in place structures uh, and uh, institutions that would ensure that the party remained in power, but that it was a, 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 a shared, an institutional power and not an individual power, uh, Xi Jinping has moved in the opposite direction. Uh, moving away from uh, collective uh, leadership to an individual uh, leadership uh, with, with uh, Xi Jinping uh, at the top. Uh, and I would say his goals are really uh, working from uh, formal shell to, again, to The Economist, is, is she is a nationalist. He, uh, he, he, he wants the same thing that Deng Xiaoping wanted, which is uh, a China that is respected, that is powerful, that is rich, that won't be pushed around anymore. Uh, he is, I think, as Deng Xiaoping was, he is a party animal. He sees the mechanism uh, for, for that uh, return to global importance and prominence and power uh, as the Communist Party. Uh, and then finally, uh, it, it, he's determined uh, that, uh, you know, that he is the guy to, who can make that happen. And that the, the act of uh, consolidating his leadership uh, will also consolidate party control over China, which will also consolidate China's ability uh, to return itself to the pro prominence that, that she wants to. So uh, China and the party and Xi Jinping are in really great shape, right? I mean, if you look at the record of, of China over the last 30 or 40 years, it is truly spectacular. Uh, you know, people have gone from earning maybe $100, $200 a, a year, a, a month, to now per capita income per capita is about 10000 a year. And if you're living in a city like Shanghai or Beijing or, or, or Guangdong, it's very comparable or not higher than, than U.S. per capita incomes. Uh, China is uh, an active and really influential member of the international community, the UN Security Council. It, uh, it controls, or not controls, uh, has a leadership of, of uh, more of the specialized agencies in the United Nations than any other country. Uh, it has huge ambitions in terms of uh, commercial diplomacy, uh, uh, infrastructure development globally. So you have just really a spectacularly successful China from a, a, a lot of uh, uh, perspectives. But that's not what it feels like. Uh, when you look at how China and how the party behaves uh, domestically, uh, you know, uh, about a million uh, Chinese government officials and party members have been uh, uh, subjected to corruption investigations or prosecution over the last few years. Uh, they, the, uh, uh, this is the great uh, uh, firewall of China, which I realize my picture doesn't do a good job on. But you know, the uh, controls on the internet and, and uh, social media are uh, uh, tight and tightening uh, uh, essentially every day in China. Uh, the, the, the ability to communicate uh, with, with uh, fellow citizens is getting harder and harder in today's China. There are hundreds of millions of uh, uh, surveillance cameras in China that are integrated into a really sophisticated network of, of control and monitoring and surveillance. Uh, and you know, out in Western China, up to a million Uyghurs and ethnic minority uh, have been in and may some, many, many are still in camps. So the, 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 uh, the government and the party are not acting, they're not behaving like uh, a, a, uh, uh, institutions uh, that are comfortable uh, with their position. And I think there, there are a few reasons. One, I think it's just generally Xi Jinping uh, uh, he, uh, sort of personally seems to be very comfortable uh, uh, with control. It's just a, a, at a personal level. But also, I think the uh, uh, challenge of governing China is getting more difficult. It used to be oversimplifying. Uh, but if the party, if the state could deliver economic growth, uh, most people were generally satisfied, and, and China was pretty good at delivering that economic growth. Uh, this is the forecast, though, for the next, you know, until uh, 2034. It's going down. It's getting harder uh, uh, to, to get, as the economy gets bigger, uh, it's harder to grow the economy. Uh, demographics are getting a lot tougher. I mean, those of you who watch uh, what's going on in China, I thought one of the most interesting and probably under uh, reported stories was a squabble in, I think it was March or April, 
about the census. It took about two or three months longer to, for, for China to release the census than expected. It was supposed to come out in, out in March. It wasn't finally released until June. When it did come out, it showed population growth over the last decade of about 20 million people. I am pretty confident that they spent between March and June trying to figure out how to show that the, the population had grown because they were so alarmed that, in fact, probably the population has already begun to shrink, that the population has already peaked. And that is, a, you know, uh, in another decade, there'll be about another 150, 100 plus million uh, people my age and about 70 million fewer workers. So you're going to have a lot more people retiring, uh, people like me living off the taxes that people like you uh, are paying. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a big challenge uh, for any, any uh, government. Uh, the, uh, one of the big tailwinds uh, of the Deng Xiaoping era was the fact that China was, was developing an export-focused economy as the world was uh, 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 deciding that uh, global trade was a great idea. That's not where we are today. Not, uh, China is now, uh, uh, has a significant, although uh, uh, a decreasing percentage of its economy based on exports, but uh, the ability to uh, sort of export your way to prosperity, particularly for a, a country with, uh, with China's economic structure, is much more difficult now than it was. The big news now, of course, that even if you're only sort of uh, reading Bloomberg or the South China Morning Post, the big economic news in China is, is uh, the, the real estate sector. For decades, that was a source of, uh, uh, China was able to spin the uh, uh, real estate into gold. The, the fact that there were few other places to invest uh, for, for ordinary Chinese to put their money. Uh, and that it, uh, you know, if you put your money into real estate, you could count on a double-digit return. In fact, it became sort of the expectation uh, that you would get double-digit uh, returns on your investments in real estate, uh, and that it was always a, a safe bet. You know, go back a couple of slides to demography that that simply can't continue. I mean, the Chinese can they, they control the banks and they can control security services. So I think they'll be able to control. Uh, uh, the uh, adjustment of the uh, real estate bubble in China, but they, they, they can't control the laws of economics, that if you have fewer people chasing more uh, real estate, you're going to end up with a lot of this. You're going to end up with a lot of real estate that people aren't interested uh, in living in. Uh, and debt is going up. Uh, you know, China, even just a decade ago, uh, was really striking for how little debt it had at the, at the uh, national government level, the local government level, and the individual. Now that has turned around and really shockingly high level of debt uh, for, uh, uh, for a country at its <coughs> development level. So lots and lots of, of uh, tailwind oh, and, and foreign investment, still lots of it, uh, but it's becoming more difficult. And this slide predates uh, COVID when you know, now if you're a foreign business person, you really can't even get into China. It's really challenging to get in. Uh, uh, and so just lots of things that were easy 10 years ago, 20 years ago, are much, much more difficult uh, uh, for a Chinese economic plan. But even with all those tailwinds and even with all of those uh, challenges, at some point, Chinese, the, the Chinese economy is going to be bigger than the U.S. economy. It's not going to be bigger on a per capita basis. That is a long, long way off, if ever. But it's on abs in absolute terms, it may have already passed. It's really dependent, dependent on how you judge the size of the economy. But at some point, the red line is going to pass uh, uh, the blue line. And that has a lot of implications for the United States. Uh, uh, you know, just the fact of a growing China, a China that is significantly larger, more powerful, uh, you know, more sort of military, cultural, political, economic power uh, is a big challenge to a country like the United States, which since the Second World War has been used to being the big dog, uh, particularly in Asia. Uh, and since uh, 1990, when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, all of, most of your lifetimes, I will exclude a few of you, I think, uh, it, it has been a unipolar world. That's not the case anymore. Uh, it's certainly getting very close to not being the case. Uh, and, uh, and so what do you do about it? Barack Obama, and uh, uh, in the Obama administration, his general approach was to uh, comprehensively engage China, to, to, uh, uh, to 
not entangled, but to, to draw China into as many international and bilateral structures as possible to invest China uh, to the extent possible uh, in the existing order, to make China a, a stakeholder in, in an order from which it has been, it had been uh, the, the uh, uh, major, or one of the major beneficiaries, if not the biggest beneficiary. At the same time, uh, uh, Obama, uh, I, I won't say hedged, but, but understood that uh, uh, the United States had to uh, advance its own interests uh, outside of China, where China didn't play by the international rules, didn't play by the rules that the United States had set up uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, and one of the big parts, of it, you know, you talked about the rebalance, moving some troops. Uh, Obama was the first, but not the, uh, uh, not the last, and, and, uh, to talk about we need to rebalance the, where we focus our diplomacy. Not in the Middle East. We don't import oil. We are, we are bogged down in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that's not really a productive use of American resources, diplomacy, and, and uh, security. Uh, we need to shift those to Asia. But not just security, because you know, the region is interested in, in an American security presence, but what the region really wants is sort of a broad-based, comprehensive presence. And uh, the Obama administration plan on that was what, what's called TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a, a, a high standard trade agreement that would uh, link the US economy with those of economies like Japan and Vietnam. Uh, uh, countries that shared uh, U.S. perspectives on the world, but also shared a concern about uh, about uh, 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 the growth of China and the direction of not just the global trading system, but generally uh, global institutions. Uh, I thought it was a great idea. I think uh, the uh, execution was not ideal. That you know the plan to pass TPP was essentially hope Hillary Clinton won and pass it in the. Uh, in the lame duck period between Obama and Clinton. Spoiler alert, uh, Hillary Clinton didn't win. Uh, uh, Donald Trump took a very different approach to, uh, uh, not just to TPP, which he pulled out the day uh, he took office, but also generally uh, uh, to the United States role in the world. A much more confrontational approach, not just to China, uh, although it was very confrontational, but also to some of our traditional allies uh, and partners, so a, a much less uh, ambitious view of, of the United States and the world. I would say Joe Biden, this is a picture of Joe Biden uh, as uh, Vice President yucking it up uh, with Xi Jinping. Uh, they have not yet yucked it up face to face uh, <laughs> because of COVID. And it sounds, although I haven't been involved in those meetings, that they haven't even virtually yucked it up too much, that they've been a little bit uh, uh, testing. Uh, uh, Joe Biden is kind of a hybrid between uh, 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 Barack Obama and, uh, and uh, Donald Trump. A lot of Donald Trump's uh, uh, trade and economic policies, Joe Biden still has in place. Uh, the difference, I would say, between the uh, Biden and the Trump administration has been on the allies and partners. And, and uh, uh, Joe Biden has seen that one of the really big uh, assets the United States has is a web of relationships, partnerships, alliances around the world. Uh, not just to, to check or to uh, uh, respond collectively to the challenge China uh, puts forward, but increasingly, that is the big geopolitical challenge uh, that all three of those administrations looked at, and that will be one of the big focuses, I think, uh, of, the, uh, of the Biden administration. I will give you a couple of more minutes and then turn to questions. I wanted to talk about climate a little bit, one, because I think it is the big issue uh, that we've got to deal with. Uh, uh, as a uh, as a species, but also because I think it really matters, and a lot of the, the, the uh, strains that I talked about uh, in the what, four or five hours I've now been talking uh, uh, are, are are sort of highlighted in what's going on. First of all, uh, today on, on climate, I put up Rachel Carlson's book uh, uh, Silent Spring because. Chinese get climate the way we don't in the United States. And I think part of that is our environmental movement was born in the 1970s, and the issues that, that spurred it were different uh, from when China's environmental movement really kind of emerged. And it's been percolating along. But I think one of the things, this is a view from uh, uh, my, where I lived in Beijing uh, in my last job. Uh, the, the bottom picture in that too is, is on a good day. The top one is actually not on a terrible day. On a terrible day, it would have just been undifferent, 
undifferentiated gray, you wouldn't be able to see anything, but it would not be a great illustration. So I took just a kind of not really good day. Uh, and this is, uh, this is kind of what, what spurred the Chinese environmental movement, or Chinese uh, environmental consciousness, is when they would look out the window and just if you lived in a major city, the air was atrocious. Uh, and that, uh, that realization of just how, how much impact uh, the, uh, China's economic development had had uh, on the environment came at the same time that the globe was talking about climate uh, and the threats of climate change. And so for most Chinese, it's not a question of how, you know, that you hear sometimes here in the United States, well, how is it possible for human beings to affect the environment that much that you know what climate scientists are taking because if you look out your window in Beijing and the air is uh, you know, if the, 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 the pollutants are sometimes you know a hundred times what the WHO level of uh, uh, recommended level of, of pollutants it's really easy to to to, to, uh, uh, to understand that so Chinese sort of at a at an individual level get climate the way sometimes we don't in the United States I think the Chinese government also gets climate because uh, China is really vulnerable uh, to the effects of climate change. Whether it's the coastline and rising seas and the fact that the majority of Chinese GDP and most Chinese population, the richest areas are all areas that are threatened by rising seas. Or if you look inland or, or, or north, where they're really vulnerable to the melting of the glaciers and, and the, the impact on severe weather, drought, that sort of thing that will affect already limited arable land. The government understands that they really uh, uh, are threatened by, uh, uh, by, by the impacts. And then finally, again, it is just a, a, a mechanism of, of both uh, international economics and international politics that uh, Beijing has decided, I think accurately, uh, that the technologies that will go into combating climate change and responding to climate change, things like renewable energy and batteries, and you, you know what all those are, uh, are areas that they want to put, they're going to put their chips on those because they think that makes good economic sense and it will make China more competitive globally uh, in the coming decades uh, ahead. Uh, and then also just geopolitically, it's, a, it's smart to be on the right side of the issue uh, uh, in international meetings if you're talking about climate. You look bad if you're pulling out of the Paris Accord. I mean, it's just a bad diplomatic move. Uh, and so China understands uh, the, if they want to be uh, global leaders, they've got to be leaders on climate. So if that's the case, how come Xi Jinping didn't go? How come there was no ambition in the Chinese uh, 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 offer at the, at the uh, Glasgow meeting in, in, in Scotland this past week? Uh, how come China uh, approved and, reopening 130-something coal mines? Uh, it is just the intersection of a lot of really difficult issues. Uh, uh, there is China, because of its, uh, I, I would say, uh, the legacy of uh, poor decisions in their uh, power generation systems, one of the most state-dominated industries in China, uh, it has done a really bad job of, of adjusting to uh, uh, the demands of, of uh, a modern economy, uh, and they are suffering some through what I think are acute uh, uh, energy shortages that made it that has sort of forced the government to back off its short-term ambitions. I will say, uh, uh, Stan talked about one of the things I do is I work for a group called the Cohen Group, and we help American companies think about what they're doing in China. We have a lot of companies on the ground, and they're saying it sure looks like the the, the Chinese. Uh, are not backing off their climate ambitions. In fact, it's really, really difficult. If you are an emitting industry, and I know it's not just foreign companies, uh, if you are uh, using power, you are under severe pressure uh, to reduce your consumption. So I think what we're seeing now is uh, uh, a, a temporary uh, adjustment as the Chinese figure out how to move next uh, in their ambitions. I would say also, that uh, you know, on the on the political side, I wouldn't have sent my boss to to uh, to Co uh, not to Copenhagen to uh, uh, Glasgow, uh, having to just had to make those kinds of uh, really tough domestic decisions, and uh, knowing that, uh, that if he goes, he's going to have to come back. And the rule is in China, if you travel overseas, you have to spend three weeks in quarantine, 
and it's just really awkward for any leader, a Democrat, democratically elected or uh, appointed by the, uh, the uh, 19th Party Congress, to say, well, those rules don't apply to me. And so there was just sort of the awkwardness of, of uh, showing up at a meeting like that uh, and then uh, you know, skipping out on the consequences on the other end. I, I, I think, kind of, and I, I will stop here, Rachel, and turn it over to you, but I will say I'm a little, I am pessimistic about the direction of U.S.-China uh, relations. I'm pessimistic because the fundamentals, even on something like climate, uh, are just, it's difficult to get past uh, the disagreements uh, that we have at a political uh, and a uh, sort of uh, geopolitical level. And so, even though I warned you at the beginning of this talk to not to take things you know, that challenge assumptions, my assumption going forward uh, is, that, uh, is that just as the uh, aftermath of the Cold War was uh, sort of uh, uh, narrated the arc of my career uh, as a, uh, from the 1980s until, until a couple of years ago, I think the competition between the United States and China is going to define the arc of your career, whether you're in government, whether you're in industry, you know, whether in fact uh, you're just an ordinary person uh, uh, living at, you know, and trying to uh, adapt to a climate that's getting hotter uh, and a world that's getting uh, a little more tense. I will end it uh, by saying I, I always get to the end of my uh, talks and I find that I've depressed myself <laughs> so I thought I'd put a picture of a puppy on. Uh, <laughs> so, that's, that's a good to end up. so with that, thank you very much. Okay, so just climate, since we've been talking about it most recently, um, you didn't mention any cultural um, dynamics. And to me, it would seem like, I mean, China's one of the few places that's had multiple large-scale environmental degradation issues in its history, right? And I'm just curious what you think the cultural, yeah, I, you know, all those other reasons, obviously, very much important. Right, I, I think, you know, if you, in fact, I was in China 20 years ago, and you talked to ordinary people, and they didn't notice it. They talked, if you were in Beijing, you said, like, you know, is this fog? They said, you know, what's going on with the air? You can't see anything. They said, oh, it's fog. It's not fog. It's pollution, right? Uh, and and it has, that has changed, at least in the big cities. And that's what drives a lot of politics uh, in China, is the middle class uh, and, and the understanding of the, the regime, you know, the state the party, that you've got to keep the, the, the middle class on your side. The middle class really cares about uh, being able to breathe clean air, about being able to, you know, the sort of the, the higher order things, of not just economic, uh, uh, how much money do I have in my pocket. And so I think culturally, I, I was trying to get at that when I talked about sort of the, the Chinese get it, that I think they get it that, that climate is a threat to them, and they understand, you know, not just at the government level, there's not a debate like there is in our system about, you know, do we need to respond, respond to climate? But I, and there's not pressure from below, uh, except for we got to clean clean stuff up. I and mean, they understand the impacts of. of, of uh, so uh, many government officials are scientists already, right? That's one thing. And then, to some degree, I don't know if you agree with this, but um, they can are on average or perhaps a little bit more farsighted. You know who your ancestors were sometimes thousands of years. Section. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to go down that road of culture matters all that much. The political culture enables people to be a little more strategic in planning. But you know what? There are a lot of, a, a lot of strange uh, aspects of the Chinese political culture that make it very short-sighted too. That, that if you're a local official, a or a you know, provincial official. You're, you're assessed on a couple of things. It used to be you were assessed on one thing, GDP growth, and you had to hit a, a, a target. If you hit the target, you're putting yourself in a good position for, uh, for promotion. If you didn't, you know, you're probably not gonna uh, be on the list next time. And that promotes really short-term thinking of, 
I gotta grow the economy, and I don't care if the guys are dumping sludge into the into the rivers. That's really changing, but it's a hard cultural thing to change because it's easy to measure GDP growth, and it's also easy to fake it. But but uh, but you know, measuring GDP growth and emissions and education level, that's what that's one of the real challenges of of a big complicated system. Uh, you know, trying trying to have uh, uh, complex measures for that, uh, and that's going to be a hard. It's going to be harder to change. It's going to make it's going to make China harder to govern because of that. Uh, so you, looked, as you probably know, the sixth plenary for the Planning Committee for the Mexican Party Congress is currently taking place right now. So I was wondering what you think is going to be at the top of the agenda, whether that be Taiwan, the Belgian Initiative, the Environment or uh, the South China Sea, or something different for that matter? No, I'm going to make Tim or Tim. Tim, Tim. It's going to be history, right? <laughs> uh, you know, as a history major, I tell you, it will be, it's funny. You know, uh, uh, I make fun of history majors. I can, because I, I was one. I am one, I guess. Uh, but that's going to be a big one, is sort of defining, uh, sort of rewriting Chinese history in a way favorable to Xi Jinping, and to, to, to uh, pave the way for uh, a, why it makes sense, why he is on par with Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, why uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, uh, why the system should set aside uh, the guardrails that Deng had put in place to prevent something like this happening again. And I think that's going to be a big focus of the, of the plan. And the other thing I think is, look, they've got their own uh, firefighting exercises, and if you're looking at what's going on in the Chinese economy right now, I think that's got to have to be part of it. Because uh, I talked a little bit about real estate. I really worry about real estate in this worry in the sense that if you look at what can cause instability in China, real estate is one of the big ones. And Evergrande, you've all seen this. Uh, I will date myself. Those of us, I see a few of you who remember the savings and loan crisis here in the US. $300 billion lost from savings and loan prices. This one Chinese company uh, is, is $300 billion in, in hot. Um, and, and it is teetering on the brink, and now it's threatening to bring a bunch of other, a little bit less shaky, uh, similar businesses down with it. Uh, and if you're if you're a Chinese official, that's bad news in and of itself. Having that big, about a quarter to a third of the Chinese economy is uh, is the real estate sector, and that's a really big problem. But that's also where everyone has the most personal wealth is tied up in in real estate. That if you are uh, Chinese, you're by far and away, your biggest asset is the money you have invested uh, in your house and the growth that, that that has produced by sort of year after year of really good growth. And so people's well-being, their sense of prosperity is tied up in the idea that real estate only goes one direction. And if that starts uh, starts changing, you know, one of the things the party is really conscious of doing is to make sure they squash anything that would stir up people across wide geographic areas and across uh, uh, a number of socioeconomic strata. And real estate will hit everyone. It will check all of those boxes. And so they're, I think, really going to be concerned about how do we get this under wraps without, and that's, that's a challenge. They got lots of, China's sitting on a lot of foreign exchange. They could pay it off, but without sort of perpetuating the moral hazard of everyone thinking, I can keep following my money into real estate because if it goes bad, the government will, will pull my uh, 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 assets out of the fire. <laughs> um, so um, with this sort of um, rise in China or whatever, um, uh, for like basically the American psyche and things like how we view our own world, it's sort of changed quite dramatically. Like, for instance, in the last six years, uh, both like right wing and left wing populists or whatever have sort of, um, you know, um, sort of uh, had sort of a changed view on what uh, our role in the world should be. And it's, it's sort of like with the right wing populists, they, they argue that, you know, we should have an isolationist uh, uh, role in, you know, comparison to China. And left wing uh, uh, argue for a sort of withdrawal. And um, basically, my question is: Is that do you think that um, the United States has a leadership role still in the, the world in terms of like uh, climate change? Uh, 
hope so. I mean, my one, I spent my career uh, uh, trying to advance American leadership, but my experience has been that organizations don't run themselves. That, that if you don't have uh, a uh, if, if some country isn't making things work, then uh, then they're not going to work, and things will break down. And I, you know, if you look at periods when there weren't into, uh, structures uh, sort of holding uh, the international system in place, things fall apart. And I think that's, I mean, there are a couple of risks that I see out there. One is that there'll be some kind of accidental conflict. The United States and China, I don't think, are interested in getting into a war. But because we operate so closely together uh, in places like the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, I think there's a risk of that. The other risk to the United States and to the world is just that the structures that are, have been in place since the end of the Second World War break down. You see that happening a little bit with the WTO. You see that happening with the, uh, the, the UN not operating as it might uh, in the past. And then on climate, uh, the fact that there's really not a, a system for uh, uh, structuring what people see as a crisis, uh, and uh, in the majority of people on to see as a crisis, and then turning that into action. And there, I mean, I, 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 I don't despair of the United States, but we are not playing the role we could play on, on climate. Uh, and and I, I worry about that. I don't, I don't see China playing that role either, because what China has not shown itself willing to do is to be uh, on, on commerce the buyer of last resort. That, that China's role in international commerce has been as a major exporter and less of as, as the US role has always been, sort of be the, the country that would buy things, uh, run up trade deficits, and keep the system running. I don't see China playing that role on, on commerce, but either do I see it on, 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 on climate. Okay, uh, a lot of the issues that we talked about, we talked about um, stuff that challenges different sectors of geopolitical interests. One thing that wasn't mentioned uh, that I'd like to bring up is the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, can you speak a bit to how uh, the Chinese might view that, the role it plays in their policy, and how the U.S. might best it? Repeat the question, please. Sure. He's, the question is about the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a really ambitious uh, effort by the Chinese, sort of to to uh, to take Chinese know-how in terms of building infrastructure, but also Chinese capital uh, and and uh, labor, uh, and build out uh, infrastructure generally on commercial terms, uh, although some uh, there are some brands uh, build out infrastructure uh, in in other parts of the world. Uh, Southeast Asia, there's a lot of it. There's a little bit, there's a lot in Africa. There's some in Latin America, a little bit in Europe. Uh, I don't know, I'm not terribly surprised. There's a lot of energy with Belt and Road. I mean, the name is one thing, but when you have a lot of energy, you have a lot of uh, expertise, and you have a, lot of, have a lot of money, it seems to me perfectly natural and, and sort of unavoidable that that is going to pop up somewhere. And so whether or not it was called the Belt and Road Initiative, I think, be surprising to not have that happen, uh, and the, there is there has been a lot of alarm, concern uh, in Washington and other other places about you know the Chinese are are uh, diplomacy and, and uh, 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 tying the rest of the world uh, into the Chinese orbit. The Chinese response and, and the, the, the countries that are borrowing uh, Chinese money. Uh, uh, say, well, you can't beat something with nothing, and the U.S. isn't putting money on the table. The, the, the U.S. isn't offering an alternative uh, to what the Chinese are offering. And until there's a better offer out there, we know it's not perfect. We know that there are problems with uh, uh, borrowing money, uh, and, you know, and that some of these uh, projects are not financially viable. But we got to get, you know, we need ports, we need the roads, and no one else is Put it out there. So you know what? The, the, there are some initial steps in Washington and in Japan, and, and uh, among some groupings the United States is a member of, uh, to think about how to put more money uh, behind alternatives, not so much as competitors, but just so people can shop around and put pressure uh, on, on uh, uh, Chinese lenders and the Chinese system to, to provide a better offer. And in fact, if you look at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, uh, that's kind of what's happened. Uh, China put it, uh, put it out, 
probably what, 2015, 2016, it was a, a Chinese alternative to the Asian Development Bank. But what it would be, China would have, in, in the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, China has a relatively small share uh, of the decision making rights. Uh, in the AIIB, China's role is much larger. Not, not a majority. They, they still need to have uh, other countries support them, but they have a much larger vote because they think, hey, we got a lot of money, we should have more of a say. But you know, the fact that you have countries like Japan, Germany, and, and Italy, and France in the AIIB means that they have pushed for much higher standards. And essentially, the AIIB is now a, uh, another high quality uh, uh, multilateral investment bank. So I, I think actually we've been, I would say, a positive example of how engaging with the Chinese uh, has, has moved Chinese policy and outcomes in a good direction. A couple questions. Sorry. One, um, do you think that the uh, Chinese pressure on the Uyghurs and also their lack of attendance at COP26 has to do with the large oil fields that they just happened to find in Xinjiang and that the Uyghurs sit on top of those? I don't think so. I mean, I think that that's been, that's been, uh, I, I had, <laughs> they say it's one of the largest oil finds in the, in the world right now. Yeah, but, but I mean, I just think this is this is just sort of the the the, uh, the Chinese policy of the Uyghurs is just the sort of the outcome of uh, generations of different approaches they've taken in Western China. Uh, I had an opportunity. I, I guess it seems like just recently, the last time I was in China, it was more than two years ago now because of COVID, to meet with a guy from the the, uh, the state council, which is the, their cabinet's uh, think tank, and he happened to deal with minority issues. And his, it, I, this was before the, the uh, camps were rolled out, but he was obviously previewing them, previewing them for me. And he said, look, we've tried everything. We've tried assimilation, we've tried uh, being nice, uh, we've tried to move uh, Han Chinese in, uh, and now I think we just have to get tough. And I think that that's more of it, that, that this is just, it's a more of a reflection of Xi Jinping uh, really being focused on control, that he wants control there uh, and control sort of globally. I think there's a little bit on the point of, of Chinese fossil fuel consumption that Xi probably didn't want to go to COP, to, to uh, Glasgow uh, as, as <coughs> China was upping in the short term, I think, uh, its consumption of fossil fuels. But I don't think it was so much the oil, but, but more the, the coal, the, the, just a, real, a really big short term surge of coal that's going on. And we'll, there are really awkward questions about that uh, if you're going trying to, to uh, portray yourself as a leader on climate issues. It's been speculated that Xi Jinping will remain in power for another 15 years. And in that time period, China will make a move on Taiwan. Do you think he plans to stay in power for another 15 years? And do you think during that time period they will make a move on Taiwan? Thank you, So I, I don't see how, I, I don't know how his, his uh, uh, gallbladder is doing, or I, mean, I don't know if Xi Jinping's got 15 more years in him, but I have a hard time seeing how anyone but Xi Jinping will be the party secretary uh, indefinitely, because it's hard to get off. Once you, once you have gotten rid of the, the, uh, the institutions that Deng Xiaoping put in place, to ensure that you know you get 10 years as party secretary. After five years, you pick a person, a guy, a male, I mean, you don't have to, but he will be a man, because that's how Chinese politics work, uh, who will be your successor, and he is groomed for those five years to replace you. And that's broken now, and there's not anything, there's now no channel to come up with a new, uh, with a protege who will be the next party secretary. And it just, he doesn't seem to me like the kind of guy who's going to now put one of those in place. So what I, I mean, that's one of the sort of, depending on the, the health of Xi Jinping's gallbladder, you know, short or medium term challenges, but uh, you know, I, I think in the long term, he's gonna go the way we all go. And so you know, you're not gonna avoid that. That what happens when he goes, because you're then gonna have lots and lots of uh, people who are competing over getting exactly uh, at, at the problem Dunn was trying to avoid uh, uh -huh. succession. So I think that's a real problem uh, that, that uh, down the road. On what it means for Taiwan, 
I will say, I say this from a position of, like I owe my entire career to Taiwan. Uh, when I was this uh, 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 no future history major from the University of Illinois, Taiwan gave me the scholarship uh, to study Chinese. You know, it's there where I learned how to speak Chinese. It's there where it kind of set me in, in motion. So I have an extraordinary fondness uh, for Taiwan, and I worry about about what's going on because you know I, I think one of the real successes of American diplomacy, real successes of how the U.S. has dealt with China, has been uh, the success that it has enabled Taiwan to have. That for 50 years, uh, even though it's been a point of contention ever since Henry Kissinger went over to China in 1971, uh, uh, it's been kind of the central point of contention. Nevertheless, we've managed to manage uh, 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 the dispute we have and allow Taiwan to democratize, to develop into, you know, to really be a spectacular example of if you uh, manage your economy right, uh, you can succeed, you can go from middle income status to really uh, develop income status. Uh, and the, the, the status quo, the sort of set of agreements that the United States would uh, limit itself how it interacts with Taiwan, that China would limit how uh, the, the sort of pressure it puts on Taiwan, and, and Taiwan would limit its aspirations in terms of independence and uh, involvement in, in uh, organizations that require statehood as a membership. Those are all breaking down. Uh, I think my personal view is it would be really dumb uh, for the Chinese, for, for Xi Jinping to decide to, uh, uh, that, that, that now is the time to resolve this. It is the kind of problem that is great to say must be resolved is the kind of problem that would be terrible to resolve. Because even, even in the, from the Chinese perspective, the best case scenario of a successful invasion, and that's not a, a given because Taiwan uh, is pretty capable, and there's the question of how much militarily, it's, it's a tough military problem because there's, there aren't a lot of beaches, it's a, it's a small place, it's easy to defend a small place. But you know, the 1.3 billion Chinese, it's a huge uh, uh, focus, and, and, and it, uh, even with American support, it's, it seems to be a soluble military problem. Uh, but the international reaction and the impact on the Chinese uh, uh, economy and standing in the world would be pretty catastrophic. Even in sort of the best case, the U.S. and China don't end up going to war uh, over. So I, the Chinese are a lot of things. They're not stupid. They, they you know, they. they been very careful in, in making decisions and not uh, risking uh, the, the uh, successes that they've had. I think that's likely to, to prevail. Uh, uh, I, I think what isn't helpful is I, I've been a little disturbed, not just by, I mean, I've been disturbed by some of the things coming out of Beijing, but also out of Washington, where we've done things to, to stick our thumb in the eye of, the, of Beijing that don't actually help Taiwan uh, in its uh, advanced Taiwanese security. So you know, inviting the de facto ambassador, the Taiwan representative in Washington, uh, unofficial, uh, to the inauguration, doesn't make Taiwan any safer, doesn't make it any easier to defend the island, uh, but it does irritate Beijing. It does sort of put one more uh, uh, grain of sand on the scales that say, the, the status quo is changed irrevocably. We have to act now if you're Beijing or we're going to lose this. And you know, that would have, so, so I think those sorts of things uh, worry me, that, that sort of the, the gradual erosion of a status quo that has been really successful. So in terms of um, global control, I, I find it interesting because you talked about earlier how Xi Jinping is like a nationalist. And I, I wonder, because it's really interesting, China's made up of, particularly Taiwan and Hong Kong really interest me, is these like kind of unique governments that are part of China, but are like their own things. And so I was just wondering your thoughts on why China would make these potentially, potentially internationally like risky moves if their goal is global control. Why take the risks of potentially uh, destabilizing Hong Kong or bringing it into China or, you know, even positing that they might invade Taiwan or, you know, raising tensions there. Why take that risk? Uh, I, mean, I think Hong Kong and, and Taiwan are different. Yes. Uh, that's important. Uh, 
and I think it gets back to the question of the Uyghurs in, as far as, as Hong Kong, which is control. That you know that uh, there are some things that a that uh, the China of the pre Xi Jinping China could accept for a couple of reasons. One, that China's relative strength was less a decade ago than it is today. And two, that Xi Jinping wasn't in charge. I think there was a personal aspect to it that that uh, you know the protests that went on in Hong Kong. Uh, COVID period, whatever those protests, I think it was in, uh, was it the fall of 2019, uh, that, that that just stuck in uh, Xi Jinping's craw, and looking at that saying, you know, this is part of China that's not acceptable. And Taiwan's different. Taiwan is, has never been part of the People's Republic of China, uh, and uh, uh, th that, I think, would be a, a, a level far, far more serious, the, the world would look at that as, as a much bigger step. Ultimately, you know, the, uh, beyond, uh, as a question of leverage, the world didn't have much leverage on, on uh, what Beijing did in Hong Kong. Uh, that, and I think there'll be more in the event of, of something. You know, that's one of the things that's staying uh, Beijing as far as Taiwan is concerned. Yeah. recommendation to, to put a, an air monitor on the top of the embassy was, was put forward by someone a really, really junior person, probably had been in government maybe four or five years, and, and the State Department doesn't, uh, is not a, a, a sort of spoiler alert, is it's not a venture capital, it's, it's not a startup operation, it's really sort of uh, uh, hierarchical and, and things work their way up the system. This was a recommendation put forward by a really junior person said, hey, you know, we should know what the air is we're breathing. And once, once within the embassy, we knew what, we were, uh, 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 what the air we were breathing had in it, you know, the next uh, uh, sort of data point was, you know, if you're a U.S. government official, if you're a, a, a State Department serving overseas, we have what's called a no standard. We can't, I guess it's done. Uh, <laughs> if we know a threat to ourselves as officials, share with American citizens, and that we, we have an obligation to share those, those risks uh, with the American citizens we serve. So, so then the next decision was, well, we know we're going to have to let American citizens know. Uh, and so, you know, we put it out on our uh, Twitter. Did we have Twitter then? Facebook? Some, some uh, uh, one of these newfangled uh, technologies. I think, it was, I think it was just the embassy web. Yeah, the embassy web page, right. We had that too. I, did not, uh, I was not the father of that success either. Uh, and then, you know, anyone could look at the uh, embassy web page. And so uh, we put it up. The, the, uh, the Beijing government blocked it. <laughs> uh, uh, and we had a long conversation about, you know, that we have to serve our uh, American citizens. They have the right to know this stuff. And so after a, uh, uh, some back and forth, the uh, Beijing parties relented and agreed to put it up. Uh, and it was really transformational. That ordinary Chinese uh, looked at, they would go to the, I mean, the American embassy in Beijing's website is not fascinating stuff. So, but it got a ton of traffic because people wanted to see what they were breathing. And then they put a lot of pressure within Beijing to, hey, how come we have to go to the American Embassy to find out what the air is like? We want, you know, we should get this from our government. And so Beijing, I love uh, uh, what they did is they took, said we will put up uh, our own air quality monitors uh, and we will uh, uh, share the, the, uh, the sort of pool uh, results 
And so they put Beijing's big place, flat mountains. They put these air monitoring <laughs> systems up the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it didn't work. You know, people insisted that they that they uh, uh, be able to get the data on what's going on in real time. And you know, Chinese politics are different than ours, domestic politics, low level, but they, they still have them and the pressure that was put on uh, led to what, what what there is today, which is, you know, anywhere in China you know the air you're breathing, you know, you can pick up an app and see. And, and it was this guy who'd been in the embassy for four or five years. Really remarkable uh, sort of testament to what small steps by uh, uh, you know relatively junior folks can do. Thank you. Okay. So you mentioned like you had a conversation with the Communist Party official about um, like what their strategy was going to be with the uh, with the Uyghurs in uh, West China. So like how like like uh, like how did that meeting come about? Like do you guys just like talk to each other like about that stuff or like <laughs> was what? Funny. And also like what's what's your response? Like what is what is he looking for? And then what are like you looking for in that like in that? Conversation. Right, so this was after I was out of government. Uh, and so I was a little less radioactive than had I been the U.S. official. But, you know, uh, just like, I guess, like, like here in the U.S., but certainly like, like in China, someone comes up to you and says, hey, there's someone you ought to meet, a really interesting person. Uh, that's what they said to me about the other guy. I'm sure they, they did not say that about me. Uh, that was not the feeling uh, I got. But, but, you know, just sort of this random uh, friend of mine says, you should meet this guy, he's interesting. Uh, and, and you know, he said, he kind of threw his hand up and said, we've tried everything. I, I said, okay, but it's not going to work. You know, that, that putting people that, you know, sort of are cracking down our experience in places, and we earned a really, you know, hard experience in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. is that squeezing people really hard doesn't help, right? It, it, it just breeds resentment. And I said, and this was, you know, I didn't know what, what was in store uh, at that point. But I, I don't think it's going to be successful. That, that you know, uh, putting people, locking people up is, is in the long run not going to be um, a, a successful thing, uh, unless it's a sort of generational uh, campaign. That's ugly to contemplate, uh, but it's not, you know, I, I go back to slide two or three with the, the row after row of, of leaving skyscrapers. You know, I, you can't dismiss that possibility uh, that, that that's the kind of plan they have in mind. So, uh, like you were mentioning, like the discontent, or well, sort of the struggles of the CCP to sort of like maintain their legitimate legitimacy with like their stagnating, the stagnating economy in China. And I was wondering, like, sort of like a little bit about the discontent with like the youth, young generation, like, with, say, like the laying down movement and stuff, like. Could that like intensify and spread to the mass populace and like be a threat to the CCP? Yeah. So let me put a little nuance on that. And I do I don't want you to leave here thinking the Chinese economy is swirling the toilet. It's you know, by American standards it's pretty good, right? You know, they they'll probably grow five percent this year. That's pretty and, and you know, that's bad by Chinese standards, but it's 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 pretty darn good. Uh, and on, on legitimacy and managing discontent, you know, the right direction, wrong direction, which is kind of the gold standard of polling here in the United States, you know, just asking people, is the country going in the right direction or the wrong direction? That's kind of the, the best snapshot of, for example, is the incumbent president going to be reelected? By those, boy, China's doing great. You know, their right direction, wrong direction is way, way better than ours. It's 70, 80 percent are saying China's moving in the right direction. So they have a lot of sort of of uh, uh, if that's the only judge, uh, they've got a lot of room to run before I think they, they're, they're going to panic. Uh, but I think he, he asked about the laying down movement. Some of you may have heard about it. It is sort of, I think people who are just exhausted, you know, uh, uh, I, I guess I would, I would equate it to if you live in San Francisco and you're paying, you know, two thirds of your, your salary towards rent, and you're you know you're working in a in a tech job from five to nine, uh, you know trying to make the money so you can pay that, and they're just worn out. And, and you know, I don't know how widespread it is. It's hard to say, you know how in a in a country without kind of public opinion polling, 
uh, that we have. But there's a movement of just people saying, I give up. I'm going to lie down and let the world come at me as it may. I'm never going to make it anyway. I, uh, there is that, but you know, the government, there also, there's also a very strident uh, 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 nationalist uh, 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 strain within China that is flowing back in the other direction, which is essentially, if, if this is what the government says we should be doing, if the parties, you know, if you look at the popularity of this Changjin Reservoir movie, you know, a, a, a take on the, on the Korean War, there's a, a you know, really, a, a strong nationalist support for the met, or strong support for the nationalist message that's coming out of there. So I think it's just I would say my time uh, looking at China is a big, complicated place, and it's probably hard to summarize in uh, whether it's uh, the online nationalists and you know, hyper nationalists that you see in the, the comment section of web, websites or the, the sort of exhausted youth. Uh, I think they are all true. Uh, and, and you know they're all aspects of a really complicated uh, uh, culture and, and country. Thank you for your service, Mr. Mackey. Has the message not so positive impact on the environment, and what are your thoughts on the system as The social credit system? Oh, I'm confident. This social credit system is really ambitious. You know, it's essentially. Uh, I, this is my, my skyscrapers across the, the river from Shanghai. Of, you know, everything you do, every activity uh, 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 you engage in uh, will sort of, you know, there will be, here it's Facebook, but, but in China, you know, it will be a sort of government uh, system for figuring out, are you doing socially responsible things? Uh, and if you do socially irresponsible things, it will have impacts on, on you. It will be hard to, you know, get, Bus tickets. You won't. You know. You will. You will, lots of different ways of, of very uh, 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 concrete ways of uh, associating costs with uh, behaviors. It's kind of creepy, uh, but you know, in terms of environmental stuff, I can see if they decide we're going to use the social credit system to make sure that people are carpooling. That that you know. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that happening. So I haven't heard of it as, as an element of it, but I, I, it's not because of lack of ambition on the Chinese side. I, I wouldn't be surprised to hear about it. I will say, the first, uh, my first assignment in the embassy in Beijing was great. I was in the political section. They would have me go out and you know talk to uh, 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 people. And I would come back, and a friend of mine and I were in the same job. And we'd come back, and, and we would learn something that day that was a total revelation. We had never heard of it. Before and every Chinese in the country of 1.4 billion people knew it. Like, duh, of course that's the way things are. China's great for that. There's just so much that that, uh, that uh, is obvious to people living in it and is, is uh, really fascinating if you're on the outside. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just want to say um, I, I heard that that had an impact on businesses you work with as well in terms of the social credit system. It, you know, I think. No, it's the upshot. They worry about it. I think they appropriately worry about it. But I can't think of any of the businesses I've been, I dealt with, that have said, "Oh, you know, we've gotten whacked by social the social credit system." A lot of them have been whacked by the, the two highs with the, the, the effort to cut high uh, energy consuming industries and high. Uh, uh, it, a low return on energy investment uh, uh, projects. So, so a lot of them are being hit by that. I, I can't recall any that have been sort of pinged by the social credit system itself. I, I really liked your explanation of how the Xi Jinping regime is kind of consolidated power. And I was just wondering, is there any kind of moves that either the Biden administration or the international community at large could do to pressure that regime to move away from the fossil fuel industry or like you said, the kind of inefficient um, power systems that have been in the country for quite a while. You want my honest opinion? Uh. Like we got a lot of work to do here, right? Mm -hmm. the, the country we have the most control or influence over is ours. And you know, a lot of this and, and a lot of the, the, the fretting, not fretting, I mean that's that's uh, uh, underselling. There are lots of reasons to be concerned about ideological and sort of geopolitical competition with, with China. But I think a lot of our energies are probably best directed at how we how we conduct ourselves. Uh, 
that you know, I, I think the passage of the infrastructure bill is a smart thing that we should look at. What what do we need to do to be more competitive here in the United States? Not just to be competitive with China, but also just to make us more productive, uh, efficient uh, uh, economy. Uh, the same thing on on you know. There are probably things we could do to influence China's consumption of, of fossil energy. But they have actually a pretty impressive plan of doing it. And I actually think uh, they have lots of reasons. They don't need us to tell, them, to tell them that burning coal is lousy for their environment and that uh, weaning themselves from imported oil would be a good idea. They know that. And, they're, and, and I think actually uh, 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 we will look back in a couple of decades and think, wow, you know, we probably should have been pushing for uh, photo, you know, uh, uh, solar here, the, you know, uh, developing our own production here, uh, because you know, that's where the world's going to be. And, and I think the Chinese have staked that out, and they intend to stake that out. So I don't think we, they need to push us. I think we need, uh, we need to push them. We need to push ourselves. Um, so uh, she talks a lot about like, college prosperity, and I can interpret that, interpret that as like, more like trade protectionism. And that's kind of translated to him being tougher on foreign uh, foreign companies. I was wondering if that can, will be go, that uh, go, can go hand in hand with uh, Dong's uh, China socialism with Chinese characteristics, or if that common prosperity, she's common prosperity, is completely rewriting China's economic foundation. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not scoffing at what you just asked. I'm scoffing at the difficulty of figuring out what stuff means. I have found that. Chinese, I mean, one thing, Communist Party, 90 million members, you have to be really explicit. If you've got an organization of 90 million people, you have to write everything down and say, this is what we think. This is what our, 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 our policies are. So uh, it's always really clear what the party intends to do because they have to write it down. You can't really hide it if you're giving it to 93 million people. But it's only ever clear. This gets back to my comment of, oh, that's what they mean. Uh, it's only ever clear even there, I think most Chinese analysts, what something like common pr prosperity means in, in, in hindsight. Oh, okay. That's pretty clear that, you know, four years ago, Xi Jinping said this, then he said this, then he talked about common prosperity, and now he's doing this, and that it all, and, you know, looking backwards, it's, it is linear. It does not seem linear to me uh, uh, at this point, and I think you could be forgiven for not sort of grasping exactly what the implications of common prosperity are. I personally think there are lots of, of aspects of Chinese policy that are mercantilist or uh, uh, intended to advance Chinese uh, economic, uh, 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 the Chinese economy uh, to the uh, o over foreign uh, companies. I don't think that's the general thrust of common prosperity. I think it is things like indigenous innovation and made in China 2025 and dual circulation. I think common prosperity is more focused at kind of the things that you're hearing talking about in the US. Do we break up big tech? You know, uh, do we, is, should there be a billionaire's tax? In other words, we have in, in the US, but also in Chinese society, some real inequities and some real uh, disconnects and how do we deal with them? You know, here we deal with them by arguing about it for 42 years and then, you know, finally sort of figuring something out. That's not the way China's gonna do it, I think. It, that's domestically likely when we look back 10 years from now, and it's too late to say Dave was wrong, uh, that, that, you know, that's what it kind of turns out to have been. I was going to ask, do you think it would be better if China and the U.S. ceased like, talking about Taiwan? Would like be a good sign for the future if it was just sort of an issue that they just kind of sort of like, push aside? Or is talking about it, I don't know, I'm just saying like, if yeah. it wasn't mentioned at all, it would be a good thing? A lot of things that you could think. I, I, don't, I just, it seems implausible that the Chinese will stop talking about it. I think we'd be great you know, if the Chinese want to stop talking about it and stop making, doing things that would make us nervous, you know. Because not talking, but then doing stuff that would, would uh, uh, undermine stability in the strait would be a problem, too. Uh, but it just seems really unlikely that the Chinese, having talked for 50 years about this is ours and we're going to get it back, that they're at some point going to stop. I think. Uh, uh, I think what we have to do, and one of the not criticisms, one of the, my observations about Americans is that we want to solve things, right? That, that we see problems as being solved. And I think that Taiwan has been one of those things where it's not, it's not a problem to be solved, it's a problem to be managed. And the Chinese look at the world as, as 
uh, a set of issues to be managed, not as ones to be solved. But, you know, I, I think of, we have the misfortune of having won the Second World War and the Cold War, and we think that sort of absolute victory is a, is a plausible outcome in most things. And in most things, that's probably not the case. It's good to have high goals, but just managing the problem and keeping it from getting worse, a lot of times, is a pretty good outcome. And I think that's likely to be Taiwan as well. I think we'll need to wrap up and then take one more question. Right here. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, I have a question about the Belt and Road Initiative. And it seems now that that trap diplomacy is becoming a more uh, known part of their strategic plan. And if that is becoming known, do you think that, that states will start rejecting the Belt and Road Initiative? And if they do that, do you think that will change the trajectory? of China's ascension to an economic leader? So, I mean, there are a lot of, there's, I, first of all, the Chinese themselves are looking at the Belt and Road Initiative and mm -hmm. saying, uh, what are we, is this the right thing? We've poured a lot of money into places that we're not going to get back. Are we doing this the right way? And frankly, that's not that surprising because one sort of hallmark of Chinese policy making is you come up with an idea, you have a bunch of different people implement it in different ways, you see what works, you know, you come back, you regroup, you see what works, uh, and then you do that, you do more of that. Uh, so, you know, in, as part of implementing the first half decade or so of, of Belt and Road, you had things like the court in, in Sri Lanka, you had a couple of other of these sort of debt traps where investments uh, uh, in projects that were not commercially viable will never be commercially viable. The only way to sort of Sort of resolve things has been through this really sort of Hong Kong-like uh, lease, where China now has control of a, of a, uh, a, a Sri Lankan port for the next 99 years. Did that in Greece? Did that in Greece as well? Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think that's the, the you know one. I don't think that's the fundamental drive of what's going on there. And I think for most countries are now aware of that. That as the Chinese are reviewing, you know, our are our strategic interests, are our, our financial interests being served by the way we've been doing things? I think a lot of countries are, are uh, revisiting. The challenge has been, and I think the challenge will be, in sort of uh, countries where you don't have the kinds of responsiveness to popular will, where a, a leader may have a short-term incentive uh, to sign a project that uh, has, uh, is at his or her country's long-term detriment but uh, is in his or her short-term uh, political or personal interest. And that's going to be a challenge uh, if, if uh, yeah, the level of transparency of Chinese lending uh, doesn't improve. And it's going to be, uh, that, but for that, I think you gotta, you got to get someone else at the table, right? That the, the U.S. and others have to be putting alternatives out there. They're not going to fix it because, you know, if you have a corrupt leader who's going to take, take loans, uh, you know, the, the fact that the U.S. is offering a more transparent, better deal is not going to fix that. But it will improve it uh, in most cases, I think. And you've been great. And you have challenged me. You have uh, worn my throat out. I appreciate your time. Uh, and, uh, thank you.